Welcome everyone back to the channel. Tonight's horrifying story is about a park ranger's experience when his partner goes missing overnight over at the Bear Lodge Butte Mountain. If you don't know where that is located, it is at Yellowstone National Park. And the things that he encounters, both him and his partner, will shock you beyond your mind. Prepare yourself. If you're new to the channel, subscribe, click on that bell, and smash that thumbs up and tell a friend. I'll call myself Rick for the sake of anonymity. In fact, I'll protect identities by making up names for all involved parties. I'm keen to put a lot of distance between myself and the past. Dark things lurk there. Things that would make you want to wipe the slate of your brain clean. I know I certainly want to do that. I'm in my twilight years, you might say, and I've been a retired park ranger for the past 20 years. I don't really like to talk about my time on the job, but that might not be fair of me. I think I owe the truth to those who visit Yellowstone Park. I got a duty to fulfill. Silly, right? I'm retired, but I'm still working. I suppose I never stopped being a park ranger. Not really. I was stationed at Yellowstone around the turn of the millennium. I was already well past my youth. I was a cop in a past life, but the mayhem of the city gradually took its toll. After the divorce, I needed an easy job. I needed to get away, and I thought that working in nature while still donning a uniform and wielding some form of authority would give me tremendous sense of fulfillment. All of the thrill, none of the danger. I was wrong. Bear Lodge tonight? Connie said. Surely not, I scuffled. I just find it soothing, she shrugged. There's such history and culture to that place. The Native Americans realize that. I realize it. Connie, a fellow park ranger, had a bizarre fixation on the towering monument of an indigenous rock known as Bear Lodge Butte. Those of you who are familiar with Yellowstone National Park will surely have heard of the spectacular monument. There's nothing on this earth quite like that. It's both beautiful and haunting in equal measure. A little like Connie, I suppose. Perhaps I have given the wrong impression. Let me try again. I liked Connie. She was a beautiful woman. And she was also the only woman who gave me the time of day after my wife left me. We fooled around a little. We shared something special. We even said those three magic words to each other from time to time. I suppose, in modern day terms... We would have said that we were seeing each other, and we might have said that we weren't putting a label on it. Point is that I cared deeply for Connie, but her obsession with that monolithic rock was utterly dumbfounding and disconcerting. I saw some cocky late-night climbers at the foot of the butte last night. She explained. Just want to make sure they haven't came back for another go tonight. Last thing we want is some dead teenagers to clean up in the morning, eh? I nodded. She drove off before I even had a chance to voice my opinion. It frustrated me. Connie knew I had to hold my post in the watchtower, so I couldn't accompany her on her terrifying nightly expeditions to Bear Lodge in the dark. From the top of my watchtower, I would eyeball the horizon, wondering what my friend was doing out there. Even before I understood why she persisted on visiting the monolithic monument, I knew Connie had a dreadful secret. I had to know what she was doing, but that doesn't mean I wanted to know what she was doing. My worst fears were confirmed after her aforementioned trip to the monument. When Connie didn't show up for her shift the following evening, I knew that something awful had finally happened. It had only been a matter of time. I had known that in my bones since she had first started focusing on Bear Lodge Butte. I knew something had happened to her before I wrung all of her friends and family. I knew they were going to tell me that they had not seen her in the past 24 hours. Contacting them was just a formality. I was simply ticking all of the boxes. 
I was buying some time, in actual fact. Summoning the courage, I suppose. After all, I knew that her disappearance would mean only one thing. It meant that I had to visit Bear Lodge and find out, once and for all, what had hypnotized Connie about that place. I hopped in my Range Rover and sat there for a little while. To this day, I'm deadly ashamed about that. I was wasting time, I admit that. I had never felt such deep, primal, unyielding fear. From the comfort of my vehicle's interior, I sat and watched the fir trees swaying in the moonlight. Yellowstone seemed so still and silent on that night. I longed for the park to come to life. I longed for the canopy of wildlife to provide a warm safety blanket, like a background noise of a television show that you haven't really been watching. Something to break the silence. Anything. Yellowstone did not oblige my request. There was no sign of life amongst the trees, not a peep from the pitch-black woodlands. Exhaling heavily, I lumbered up. I mentally prepared myself for the task at hand, and I finally twisted the key in the ignition. I jumped out of my skin at the sound of my vehicle springing to life. The quietness of the park had been so consuming that I was a little unprepared for the roaring of my car engine. I gently placed my hands on the steering wheel and trundled the Range Rover along long, leaf-strewn, long-faded roads. There were no late-night road trippers around. Not a soul in sight. Not an animal in the woods. Not that I could see or hear anyways. I longed for someone else to come and join me on my quest. You have no idea how hauntingly lonely that park seems at night. I've never felt as vulnerable as I did on that night. Even in the metallic cocoon of my vehicle, I felt like an insect in a cobweb. I was just waiting for the spider to come home. The drive usually felt relatively long from one side of the park to the other, but I suppose my desperation to never reach the destination had made time fly. I felt a strangling sensation in my chest when I first saw the tower of rock that Connie adored so greatly. As the towering butte of Bear Lodge began to grow larger and larger on the near horizon, so did the sense of dread in my heart. I could feel my pulse in my eardrums. It felt as if my head were slowly splitting in two. There was no doubt about it. Something wasn't right about Yellowstone on that evening. Maybe the animals knew that. Maybe that is why they had been so silent. You're being foolish, I told myself. Just wait. You'll get out of this car in a minute and hear the chitter-chatter of woodland creatures once more. I hope so. I hoped for that more than anything else in this world, but instinctive fear is something more powerful than any rational idea. It seeps into every ounce of your flesh. It consumes your every thought and feeling. No matter how much you try to reason with it, fear always wins. And for good reason, in my experience. I didn't want to ignore that feeling. Unless you've eaten something rotten, always trust your gut, my mother used to say. She also told me not to become a police officer, of course, and I was starting to wish I had stuck in that vocation. Suddenly, the mean streets of the city were looking a little more appealing than the once calm woods of Yellowstone. And that thought was only strengthened by the terrible sight of Connie's Range Rover at the foot of Bear Lodge. I pulled alongside her vehicle, which I was already sure must have been abandoned overnight. That meant something had happened to Connie. I prayed that she had simply broken an ankle and needed assistance. But even that prospect, in the middle of a national park, horrified me. What if a bear had mauled her, I wondered. What a naive thought. As a relatively new park ranger, I was innocent to the horrors of the woods. I didn't know there were things that frightened even the most fearsome of grizzly bears. I switched on my flashlight and began to stride through the small cluster of trees at the foot of Bear Lodge. There was still not a peep from the animals of Yellowstone. My torchlight illuminated rocky ground and sparsely placed trees. As open and spacious as that land may be, I had never in my life felt quite so claustrophobic. I felt watched, and with every passing moment, 
I was certain that the watcher was growing nearer. It was at that moment I heard a piercing wail, like nothing I had ever heard before, and nothing I have heard since. It sounded like a wounded newborn baby, but it was certainly not human. I was sure of that. Again, call it my primal instinct, but I knew that something unholy was with me in that park. A few seconds later, there was a rustling in the trees. Shrubbery started to sway. Dislodging rocks tumbled over one another. Something was moving in the near vicinity. That is it, I accepted. This is how I die. Shaky torchlight lighting the commotion in the trees before me, I braced for death. But death didn't come. Instead, two Native American men emerged, supporting Connie between them. She was limping. Rick, she wheezed. Connie, I cried, running towards her. What happened to you? Before we could talk, one of the Native American men, the older of the two, raised a finger to his lips and motioned for us to follow him. Dakota, as I shall call him, explained that we must move as quickly and quietly as possible. I sprinted for the car, but Ellen, as I shall call the younger man, grabbed my wrist and viciously shook his head. You drew it here with the sound of the engine, Ellen whispered, and we can't outrun it, not even in cars. We must hide until morning. Dakota stealthily guided us into a makeshift den that he swiftly forged from some rocks. We must stay here, he quietly warned, and we must not make any noise louder than a whisper. The four of us squeezed into the tiny space that Dakota had created. He and the younger man both sported faded blue jeans and matching winter jackets. They quietly explained they were father and son, but modern age. But I certainly had never heard of them back then. Put yourself in my shoes. I was a retired middle-aged cop in the late 90s, so I raised an eyebrow with the Native American elder as he simply grimaced in return. In our culture, the Wendigo is something to be feared. It is not a force that we disturb, but I cannot say the same for foolish Americans. He quietly signed. You build your watchtowers and litter these grounds with tourists, but none of you have any respect for sacred things. You do not know of the old things that live here, do you? Well, you soon will. Soon you will see the thing of which I speak. Pray that it does not see us, and if fate should smile upon us, we might just make it till morning. What is a wendigo? I whispered. Is that your name for some sort of animal? Not an animal, Ellen piped in. A wendigo is an evil spirit. It possesses people who lose their way. Some say it claims the bodies of those who resort to cannibalism. It transforms them into a large, horned... That's enough, Ellen. Dakota scolded in a nearby whisper. We've said all that needs to be said. A piercing sound sliced through the conversation. That wail. That horrible, indescribable wail. Connie sobbed intently, though she tried to do so as quietly as possible. She burrowed her face into my shoulder, muffling her staggered cries. I could still hear it, she whispered. Even when it isn't making that noise... Dakota and Ellen shared a knowing look. It was slight and speedy, but I saw it. It told me that they knew far more about the Wendigo than they were revealing. And it also told me that Connie had said or done something to fill them with unease, that only exacerbated the pit of the terror in my stomach. Oh, shoot, Ellen whispered. What? I asked. Dad? Ellen started. I know, Dakota said. I see it. The brave man clambered free from the small rock fortress that he had constructed. The three remaining hiders watched him in a perplexed state of horror. What are you doing? Ellen Whisper screeched. Dakota raised a finger to his lips and proceeded to drag his foot across the rocks and dirt. 
It was in that moment I realized what had concerned the pair of them. A bloody trail led right up to our den, like a runaway track for the vile creature that lurked in the forest. Dakota was attempting to conceal that track before the Wendigo came straight to our door. I shone the torchlight on Connie and realized I'd hastily lied to myself. Her uniform might have been bloodless, but I could see that her trouser leg had been hiked upwards. A makeshift wooden splint had wrapped around her bloody shin. A gapping, festering wound stared back at me from the depths of our enclosed hiding place. Turn that off, Ellen hissed. I obliged, quickly turning off the torchlight. I embraced Connie more tightly, stifling her tears with my jacket. Ellen and I watched in silent dread as Dakota overturned bloody rocks and covered bloody streaks in the grass with leaves. It was a haphazard cleanup job, but we were all aware of how loud the Wendigo's most recent howl had sounded. It was close. Very close. A twig snapped. We all froze in total silence. Dakota shook his head at Alan, who had widened his eyes like a deer in headlights. The son wanted to run out and save his father, but it was too late. The old man smiled warmly at his boy. Then, in a rapid burst of soundless movement, a large spindly creature charged into Dakota, swiping his body into a nearby tree with unnatural speed and strength. The horrifying apparition was barely distinguishable in the dark, and I am thankful for that, but I still saw far more of the fiend than any person should see. It was tall, far too tall, nine foot tall and sickeningly slender, an emaciated fiend. Two jagged horns protruded from its head, and its face was mostly shrouded in darkness, though its horrendous teeth glistened in the moonlight. With one hand, it scooped up Dakota's mangled, half-alive, riddling body. The most courageous man I had ever known. He spluttered blood near soundlessly, refusing to give the beast the satisfaction of hearing a blood-curdling death cry. Dakota embraced death silently. The Wendigo unleashed another of its hauntingly inhuman wails. Then, it proceeded to slide Dakota's still-living body into its grapping, gritty mouth. Its predatory teeth began to chew on the man's legs. And he finally caved, screaming into the night as the seemingly unreal being devoured his lower half. It was when the gaunt ghoul finished Dakota's legs and started to swallow his abdomen that we finally saw the Native Americans writhing seas. His screams ended, his eyes closed. Throughout the entire ordeal, I had clasped a hand over Ellen's mouth to stop him from howling and revealing our location. The Wendigo was so preoccupied with its fresh meal that it didn't even seem to notice us. And eventually, the creature began to walk away. Ellen's tears were cold, and they were leaking through the cracks of my fingers. I looked him squarely and sternly in the eyes, and he nodded as if to say that he would be quiet. So I removed my hand. The young man didn't utter a word. None of us did. Shivering, we waited until morning, and we hurriedly hoisted Connie to the car at the first sign of daylight. I wanted to leave Yellowstone behind for good. Connie certainly did. I never saw her again. But I remember looking into the eyes of the hopeful new hire and thinking to myself that he was an innocent lamb for the slaughter. That was when my watch truly began. I devoted myself to the park. I had to protect all of those innocent souls who might accidentally stumble across the Wendigo. Of course, the new hire laughed when I told him my story, and that he only solidified my resolve. It was up to me to be the protector. I was glad that Connie had left, never to return. I never asked her what had hypnotized her about Bear Lodge Butte. I never asked her what she meant when she said that she could hear the Wendigo, even when it wasn't making a sound. I was simply relieved that she had wiped her hands of the haunted park. But Yellowstone wouldn't let me go. It couldn't let me go, I think. 
perhaps, I simply felt that I had to honor Dakota. From that day forth, I wasn't looking for fires on my watchtower. I was looking for something much, much worse. <laughs>